Hello. Good morning, good morning. Oh, it's weather's taking a turn for the worse. It's a bit wet and windy. There we are. So, how are you? How are you? It's another lovely day in paradise. Then he said in Parasite then. <sighs> it's a uh, funny old time, old Piers Morgan, who I was moaning about the other day, has uh, had to go from Good Morning Britain. He basically, he uh, was judged by the politically correct mob not to have... Uh, Paid, uh, you know, not to have respected the fact that uh, well, what's her name, Megan, Megan Markle, said that uh, she'd experienced, she felt, she felt that she'd experienced racism. Basically, somebody at the palace wondered what colour the baby was going to be, and then she said that that then was interpreted by her as a racist comment and uh, the person who said it was racist and she then said she was thinking of committing suicide and, you know, typical snowflake generation stuff. And, uh, and so the people who sort of rush in to cancel everyone who's perceived to have uh, aggressed against the, 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 the uh, collective consciousness is... Um, uh, said he has to go and so he's gone that's him gone I mean the bloke was tiptoeing around hand grenades I suppose so sooner or later one of them had to go off and blow him up so that's it he left the mirror under his sack from the mirror and now he's uh, agreed to leave by mutual consent from good GMB so God knows where he'll pop up hopefully uh, on YouTube or the internet or somewhere where well, it'll, be, it'll be much easier to ignore. So, what's your day looking like? I've, I've got a quiet week on. I had a patient who was booked in, I think, at 10 o'clock this morning. And, uh, you know, we have an invoice in advance, and so it's uh, Wednesday today, and so uh, she needed to have paid her invoice uh, for a checkup by Monday, 5 o'clock, and she hadn't. Still hadn't paid it yesterday by a close of play, so we cancelled our appointment. And it is difficult to do that because you know you always think, well, perhaps she's not very good with the internet. Perhaps she's going to come in and pay cash. Perhaps she. Uh, uh, but I mean, you know, these people are. If you, if you explain very clearly what is required of them, then they they have to really either say no, I can't do that, or we've had other people who, you know, come in and pay because they don't want to use the internet they come in and and pay using their cards at the desk a couple of days beforehand so <clears throat> she just uh, didn't engage with us at all and so uh, we're, we're learning that that sort of behavior is typical of someone who is not going to turn up um, not because they wouldn't have turned up funnily enough paradoxically it's because they can't engage with the process and therefore that that sort of prevents them from turning up, which is, is somewhat concerning, you know, I mean, it's, I don't want to put obstacles in the way of people who, uh, you know, who might otherwise come in for dental treatment, but at the end of the day, I can't, uh, you know, I have to, think, you know, the patient has to engage to some degree, uh, but I suppose if they, if they get an, uh, an invoice, an online invoice and they're not confident enough to uh, deal with that then they might well uh, just say oh well blow that you know I'm I'm gonna try another dentist who's who might be a bit more old-fashioned and might have a uh, just a you know the normal just make me an appointment and then and then I can when I wake up on the morning of the appointment I can then decide whether I want to go in or not and um, that's not satisfactory from our point of view and uh, you know the, the, we lose a patient but I have learned that that, that sort of uh, failure to engage has 
especially from a new patient, is uh, you know when they don't have a stake at all in the surgery or the treatment or the dentist or the nurse or anything, and it's very easy to disengage. Uh, so, so uh, it's sort of very typical of someone who's um, who, who's a very uh, a very high. Uh, risk of being a non-attender so someone who makes an appointment and then and then you know you can't get in touch with them you, their mobile phone is always turned off uh, and uh, you, you you've had no engagement with them at all so in a way I suppose the invoice is a way of sort of forcing them to engage with us in a meaningful way uh, to the extent that they are then more likely to turn up because they feel they've got a stake in the in the arrangement Whereas, as I say, typically if someone rings up on behalf of their boyfriend, who's whatever. And anyway, I had a last uh, well a month ago. I'm, I may have posted it or not. I've got so many of these things. <coughs> I'm struggling a bit with um, processing them and, and uploading them because um, I'll try and stay current and and then just work work back through the backlog. So does mean they're going to be posted a bit a bit out of uh, sequence possibly but uh, if you go by the dates uh, I always put the dates that they were recorded and the date is also on the uh, title page hello he stopped just before a blind bridge excellent Some work there. Oh, they're moving a new caravan in. That's a big caravan park. Big expensive caravan park. Yeah, so uh, this guy who uh, was stuck somewhere and had an appointment and couldn't get to the surgery because of the snow. So we charged him because the time was wasted. And then his father, who owns a local garage, uh, rang up on two occasions, spent a long time arguing with me that I wasn't being reasonable and his son shouldn't get charged and it wasn't his son's fault he couldn't get in and he wouldn't have charged uh, someone under similar circumstances. So, so anyway, uh, we didn't, because uh, it was the second time the son had done it. And his father really didn't understand the principles involved. You know, it was a bit like... Um, you know, he's like uh, it was. I think it was a Monday morning appointment, and uh, we uh, we we made several attempts to get in touch with him, ring him, and everything. And then he he ended up paying uh, in advance for his appointment, and then like 24, 48 hours not turning up because he was stuck in uh, you know like 200 miles away, and it was snowing. And um, anyway, the point of the story is that. Uh, you know, I mean, let's say, supposing I was flying out of Gatwick um, early morning on a Monday and snow was forecast, I would think about coming home perhaps a day early if I was away or possibly staying in a hotel near Gatwick Airport, uh, you know, so that uh, I, I wouldn't miss my flight. But no, he's he didn't want to do any of that. He thought it would be much simpler just to ring up the airport and the airline and say that he's um he's uh, he can't get to the airport uh, because of the snow although the planes are still operating and um and he just uh, would would like uh, uh to you know not to not to pay for his ticket and that's just not that sort of subtlety was lost on his father anyway uh his father um when he hung up, he said to me, you haven't heard the last of this, this is not the last of this, don't think you've heard the last of this, you know. So I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. Uh, because I knew that um, we're, we're bulletproof on the uh, charging side of it. I mean, absolutely everything that we send out says that uh, you'll, you'll be charged. If you don't give us one working day's notice, you will be charged as if you had attended. I even know the phrase, because it's on everything. It's on our texts, it's on our emails and it's on our uh, reminders, our uh, 
appointment, notifications, absolute uh, website, you know, it's on everything. Oh, this is the junction of death. Just in case you've never seen it before. High hedges on both sides. And a very fast road, which is absolutely full of traffic, as you can see. Or it is sometimes. Anyway, um, first thing that happened was that we got three one-star reviews on our website. And of course that's, you know, I mean that's not not from anybody identifiable, not from the patient or his dad, but, but from three accounts that had been created at short notice, like four hours previously or whatever. And I do blame Google for that. I, honestly, I do. I think, uh, I don't think... Uh, Account, accounts that are created I think should be banned from giving uh, reviews, one star reviews or reviews at all so it's for 30 days for example um, I think that is an abuse and when you report them there's no, uh, there's no way you can get them removed you just have to put a note on that says uh, you know I don't believe this is a review from a, a patient you know and then, uh, so anybody who, but it, but it does, I mean, we had like a 4.8, 4.9 average, and it brought us down to a 4.6. So, but the, you know, I mean, we're not the first person that's happened to, we, uh, lots of, um, lots of businesses have complained about one star reviews, and it's a well known, it's called review bombing. It's a well known thing, it's not, and, and there's nothing much you can do about it. And then, so then nothing happened for about a week or two. And then what happened is somebody joined me up to Tinder. So, uh, they've obviously got my email address. And, uh, so I get this message from Tinder saying, uh, welcome to Tinder. And, uh, but also, you know, if you uh, click this link to confirm your membership, and if you didn't, uh, join then please report this to tinder so obviously i did and uh nothing further came of that but there is a possibility that this uh, idiot son of an idiot father or rather the idiot father that begat the inner idiot son has uh, started some sort of war of uh you know some sort of uh stalking type war uh, as although it's very one-sided, I mean, uh, I told Mrs. Angry, and she she was more concerned. She said it's it's a sort of a bit sinister, you know. And uh, I mean, personally, I was I was more uh, worried that he was going to knife me when I left work. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, somebody uh, just uh, joining me up to Tinder is not the end of the world. In fact, I half uh, I was half thinking of. Uh, joining but no I did uh, I did report it so. could have been worse couldn't it could have been grinder if he had any imagination he would have joined me up to grinder <laughs> oh never mind you know people do that yeah, it's just a it's just a moronic thing some people uh uh, you know, will sign sign uh, people they don't like up to all sorts of stuff. Uh, erectile dysfunction websites, all all sorts of uh, uh, funeral plans. You know, the list is endless. <laughs> Cosmetic surgery services. So I knew that was a weird thing. And then so that, so Morgan's gone. This uh, patient, stupid vendetta, which, and I really honestly think the best thing to do is completely ignore it. Cause I get spam email anyway. So it's not much more of a, it's only rankles that it's, uh, you know, but I mean, to offset the uh, annoyance that he's causing, I can just uh, think that uh, at the end of the day, I've got 300 quids worth of his son's money and for doing not much and 
uh, he's not going to get it back. So, I mean, basically I've been paid to put up with a bit of aggro. And if it gets any worse, then we, we might have to think about reporting it, but I don't think it will. It's too much effort, isn't it? It's no, it's no effort on my part to just delete it. And it's a lot of effort on their part to put the thought into what to do and, and then to do it in an anonymous way that can't be traced back to them and then and then to do it, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, anyway. So, uh, the latest craze is these non-fungible tokens. People are selling their tweets and uh, there's a lot of uh, bewilderment amongst people about what a non-fungible token is and uh, why they should be worth anything, why why you should buy a tweet, and I think it's uh, I think it's sort of generally it's down to people's bewilderment about blockchain technology and and sort of token based blockchains and things like that. People don't, they don't really understand it. That's why people you know you constantly hear people saying about Bitcoin. It's got no intrinsic value, it's a bubble, blah, blah, blah. It's not backed by anything. Um, because they really just don't understand uh, the technology. Um, it is a bit of an intelligence test, I've got to say. Um, and one day it won't be, you know. I mean, you go on Skype or, or whatever, Zoom or whatever, and you just press a button and the person at the other end of the, the world appears on the screen. Don't they? Don't, they don't worry about the technology that... Uh, that does that um, but uh, blockchain technology is still very much in the uh, you know you're, you've got you can get a competitive advantage if you understand it or, or put it this way you know you will reject it uh, unless you can understand it oh hello Lord, get that I'll have to turn my phone off I think that's a duck or a robot now be honest I think it's a robot, but everyone says it's a duck. So, so what is a non-fungible token, you know, and why is everyone getting in, in such a case about it? Well, what, what you have to under, do, uh, understand is the, um, there's a book called The Principle, Principles of Services Marketing, I think, which uh, I read when I was on holiday and I found it fascinating. And it goes into services in detail and how to sell them, promote them, etc. And um, it's got a very, very good section on uh, the difference between goods and services. It's the beginning of it. It differentiates between goods and services. What is a good? Obviously, lumber, timber is a good. And the services, uh, going to the cinema to see a film is a service. And then there's all sorts of uh, things which are part goods, part services, for example. I mean, glasses, uh, for example, uh, you get the glasses which are a good and they improve your eyesight, which is a service. So once you get into it and, and look at it and, and work out and see what the model is, it's quite uh, it's quite easy and it gives you a big, again, competitive advantage to understand this. So, uh, principle of service sector marketing, I think, yeah. Anyway, I'll put a link in there, if I can remember, in the, in the, in the video. And, um, so, if you take something like uh, Fedwire, which most of you will have never heard of, I should imagine you probably know about BAX, which is uh, the bank automated clearing system, uh, or CHAPS, which is the other one, or SWIFT, which is the European one, and Fedwire is the um, American one. And uh, Fedwire, Fedwire is uh, a sort of dollars in, dollars move to wherever they need to go and then dollars dollars come out of the other end and it is a proper money transfer system as opposed to swift whereas with swift what happens is that you say to your bank i want to pay say a thousand pounds to this other guy and they and then they work out which bank he's got and then at the end of the day all the banks all reconcile everything at midnight they all uh, the money flies around at the end of the day but Fedwire, literally the money transfers, you put the money into the Fedwire system, the Fedwire system moves the money, and then the other uh, person at the other end gets the money out. 
So it's a proper money transfer system. And um, <clears throat> you can't be a member of Fedwire unless you're a government or a bank, basically. It's for big, the big boys. Uh, whereas we, we, we all use Backstomy and Swift and Japs. And our banks sort it all out at the end of the day. They just net everything off. Well, Bitcoin is a bit like Fedwire in that you put the money in so you convert your pounds or whatever dollars into Bitcoin and then you send the Bitcoin which in general arrives you know 10 to 60 minutes later and then the person at the other end converts the Bitcoin to whatever currency they want Australian dollars Japanese yen whatever so Bitcoin BTC is pretty much a um, a substitute for Fedwire. So Fedwire has got some usefulness, some utility. <coughs> it's a useful service. It has value. It's a valuable service. But of course, uh, the people who don't understand the difference between goods and services don't can't get their brains around a valuable service like that. They can't. Uh, they believe if you can't hold something in your hands, then how can it have any value, you know? And yet, they have the right to live in their house. They sort of, every night they go and put the key in the front door, and the key works, and they don't, you know, they don't even think of the right to live in the house as a useful, uh, non-tangible non service. But anyway, um, what uh, what the the idea of a valuable something that's intangible and yet valuable is just a foreign concept I think to a lot of people. So the idea that you can own a digital good um, has come as a big shock. And those of us in the cryptocurrency world have known that you can own uh, a digital, a useful, valuable digital good for a long time because that's what Bitcoin is basically and Bitcoin Cash and Dash. But um, it doesn't have to be, your valuable digital good doesn't have to be, uh, have the properties of money. It can have any any property. So it could be a, it could be a digital picture that someone's drawn. Um, and you can say, well, you know, anyone can take a photograph of a picture or copy a picture or, but, um, but copying something doesn't change the ownership of it. And through uh, these non-fungible tokens, which are associated with the artwork, for example, you can demonstrate that you're the owner, that even though everyone may have a copy of it, that you, are, you, are actually, you actually own it. And if you think that um, that <clears throat> is a bit of a fine distinction, then, then you have to sort of imagine that supposing you are the owner of the Mona Lisa, for example. The Mona Lisa is uh, obviously hangs in the Louvre, owned by the French state or whatever. And um, <clears throat> anyone can go and see it. And uh, if you want to buy a print of it, I'm sure they sell prints of it in the shop. And there are thousands and thousands of uh, images of the Mona Lisa. And uh, But just having a, a copy of it, an image, a print, if you like, a reproduction, doesn't it's not the same as owning it you know you can't stick a print on your wall of the Mona Lisa and say I own the Mona Lisa <laughs> you're just looking at a facsimile of it and it's the same with a non-fungible token you can you can uh, assert ownership in a way which is can be easily proven and uh, and have all the benefits of uh, ownership and uh, you know in the same way as someone can own a building anyone can enjoy the building and can uh, and, and see how it was built and everything but the actual owner of the building is the only owner of the building um, so I, I don't know if that's clarified it at all but I mean that's the way I look at it and I think that's a good way to look at it and uh, if you're having trouble getting your brain around these things, then that's the framework I suggest you use because it is, it's is—it's—it's—it's uh, 
it's not at all complicated, you know. And at the moment, on, on things like the Jeremy Vine show, he is very much the blind leading the blind in terms of trying to understand what, how these things work. Right, uh, I'm talking of work. I'm there now, so I'll talk to you soon. Bye.